In the early 1960s, a new cinematic movement was beginning to appear. In post-war Japan, young directors and small movie studios wanted to see change within their country's cinema. The Japanese New Wave was born. As society began to change, so did its cinema. The movement scrapped the old established traditions of their traditional cinema and old country ways for a new take on film. The movement was partially inspired by its Western counterparts like in American films and most notably in the French New Wave. The Japanese New Wave has somewhat been considered a cousin of the French New Wave. Some of the more well-known filmmakers and studios that have been around for decades began to make the first steps towards change, with some of the film studios like Shokiku, Toho, and Nikuatsu as an example. Eventually, younger filmmakers began to draw some of their inspiration from the same influences that inspired their French counterparts. And as a result, the term New Wave stuck with it ever since. They do share similar themes and ideas like taboo subject matter, sexual violence, racism, politics, making people look and feel very uncomfortable, escape from society, and focusing on the outcast of society. The Japanese New Wave have even experimented with editing and narrative techniques. The Japanese New Wave originated within film studios themselves, establishing with and around local cinemas, and with new ideas from young directors who have been failing to thrive within the main studio system. These filmmakers eventually formed an independent production companies, most notably the Art Theater Guild in 1961, which significantly boosted the movement by producing and distributing several of the most renowned New Wave titles. Some examples being 1969 Parade of Roses and 1968's Death by Hanging. The Japanese movement initially began with the studios, but we can't leave all the credit to the studios alone. We have to mention what most people consider the film industry's blood and guts, the writers and the directors themselves. Throughout the movement, there were a large handful of directors who classify themselves as new wave directors, from the greats of Hiroshi Tashigahara to Yoshishige Yoshida, to lesser known individuals such as Mitsuo Yanagamachi. They're, they were directors that wanted to see a change in film and society as a whole in Japan. Centering in on Hiroshi Tashigahara, a staple in the realm of the movement, born in 1927. Growing up through the turmoil of the Second World War in Tokyo, he saw it change drastically around him and learned to be more critical of old Japanese mindsets that stuck around, taking to film to have a social commentary about these issues. Woman in the Dunes, a film ab adaptation of the best-selling book of the same name by Kobo Abe, quickly became Hiroshi's shining star. He went on to have it nominated for two Academy Awards and winning the Special Jury Prize at the 1964 Cannes Film Festival. This film was a striking difference to most big films that had come out in the previous five years in the Japanese golden age. This film used its runtime to convey a complete sensory experience for the viewer, utilizing extreme close-ups and sand covering sweat-soiled skin and the uncomfortable nature of being trapped in the bottom of a pit in the middle of the desert. This was a very similar tone with Hiroshi's other works, such as The Face of Another, this film also was a deep dive into a world way different. It also was a key to bringing about a little more understanding for those with disabilities, using his high stature to bring about that oh-so-important social commentary. Both films also bring up taboo topics such as rebellion, women's sexuality, and incest. Another director to get recognized for his work is Mitsuo Yanagamachi. Known primarily for his film Godspeed You, Black Emperor, a documentary covering the predominantly teenage motorcycle gang that roamed the streets of Tokyo. He re neutrally records and tells the story of being a rebellious force of kids. Most of the country has a very strict image of how children should act and want them to grow up a certain way and get good office jobs. But this film 
takes a different approach and wants to show that disobedience to the world. Many directors struck out against the studio system after feeling confined to the set standards of production. One of the least known directors of Japanese New Wave was Yoshigi Yoshida, a director who began serving the studio system at Shochiku. Yoshida worked dutifully and followed an apprenticeship for nearly two years. However, many directors struggle with the advent of television taking away their audience. Over the years, Shoshiku attempted to return to form by sponsoring innovative films. This only patched the problem and even heightened the studio's intrusion on the films themselves. This inevitably led Yoshida to leave and form his own independent production company. It was here where Yoshida found his stride in his work, creating films such as the Impasse, The Affair, and arguably his most important film, Eros Plus Massacre in 1960. The film is a biography about the anarchist Sakurai Usugi and his connection to three different women. Besides being one of the biggest films of Japanese New Wave, the film focuses on themes of radicalism and anarchism, while also balancing relationships of people from the past and present. These ideals fit in with Japan's new movement of innovation, as filmmakers told the stories that involved new ideals conflicting with the society of traditions. Eros Plus Massacre and Yoshida's other works paved the way for biographical films that covered radical stories. Filmmakers would follow Yoshida's actions and learn to truly cover stories that were radical and open conversation. Shoshe Imamura was one such follower. A former assistant to the famous Japanese director Ozu, Imamura chose his own methods and opposed many of the creative choices that Ozu made. Imamura saw himself as a cultural anthropologist, someone who looked at human beings and asked, what made them special? His films were about the complex emotions in humans and how they interacted with others. At the later end of the 1960s, Imamura rose as a prominent figure in Japanese cinema with his film, Vengeance is Mine, telling a semi-documentary story of a real murderer, Akira Nishiguchi, that went on a killing spree for 78 days. Easily, the film could depict the serial killer as being a monster, but the film is created in a way that seemingly places no blame on anyone. While the film is a fictional accounting of a true event, there is no blame placed on any one person. Seemingly, the film feels like we followed the life of someone in a neutral setting telling their life. This form of storytelling could only come from Imamura's work in documentaries. Japanese New Wave died out around the same time as the French New Wave, the legacy it left behind would be seen in the years to come. Many techniques and subject matter had become accepted in the cinema following the movement and would lead to many of the standards in modern Japanese media. The political criticism and controversial content that could be found in someone like Oshima's work being an example of what audiences would start to want from studios. The shift in desires from viewers would also help to start independent film production instead of directors being stuck under companies like Nakatsu and Toho. Shohei Imamura would be one of the first to start his own production company in the late 60s. Imamura also ha started to have his oldest son Daisuke Tengan work on screenplays for his films in the 1990s, carrying on his legacy to a new generation. Films such as Branded to Kill by Seijun Suzuki would stick with such directors as Park Chan-wook, John Woo, and Quentin Tarantino as a source of inspiration. Films like this and Tokyo Drifter from Suzuki would influence many films focusing on gangs. Examples of this can be seen with Ghost Dog The Way of the Samurai, which includes nods to Suzuki's work with scenes such as Ghost Dog shooting up through a pipe, or with a bird sitting in front of his sniper. Suzuki's style of humor and visuals that appeared in his work would go on to inspire the classic anime series, Lupin the Third, and Suzuki would end up being the director for the second part of the series, 
from episode 52 onwards, as well as directing one of the films for the franchise. Directors from this movement will continue to produce films and find success, such as Hiroshi Tishigahara, with films such as Antonio Gaudi and Francisco. Nagisa Oshima would end up being known internationally for his film Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which starred famed musicians Ryuichi Sakamoto and David Bowie in the leading roles, heard from the Cannes Film Festival. Zuki would come back to directing after his blacklisting from film had ended with his 1977 film, A Tale of Sorrow and Sadness. Suzuki also returned to the film that had got him blacklisted in the first place, Branded to Kill, with a sequel in 2001 named Pistol Opera. While the legacy of Japanese New Wave would mostly stay in the country, with many of the changes brought by the movement affecting the standards in the country, specifically, the influence can definitely be seen outside of that with figures such as Imamura or Suzuki's works and the influence they had.